Guys, welcome back to the channel. Welcome to another video. The World Cup is just a couple of days away, and it's set to be one of the most interesting and fascinating World Cups ever. Obviously, given the timing of it, it's, ha it's taking place in the winter and everything like that. It's a different time for the World Cup than we're usually used to seeing it on, on across all of our screens across the summer. But this one obviously is taking place in Qatar and it's set to be one of the most intriguing World Cups ever for a whole host of different reasons, whether it's on or off the pitch. Obviously, there are a number of reasons to this and I might talk about them as we go through the World Cup, but this is going to be purely a predictions based uh, video. I'm going to be going through a few of the countries that I think are going to be favourites or, or ones that are going to be interesting to me at least uh, as the tournament progresses. So this is just going to be purely a predictions thing based on a few of the teams that we should be keeping our eyes on. Before we go any further though in talking about them, I would like to remind you to please like the video and also subscribe if you're new. Both things always and forever be greatly appreciated. I as a fan cannot wait for the World Cup to begin. Obviously it's going to be interesting, it's going to be fascinating, it's going to be pretty controversial as well at that. Um, but from a, fuel, from a purely footballing based uh, view and opinion, it's going to be very very interesting to say the least but without further ado let's get into the video and we're going to be starting with gareth southgate's england all right first and foremost welcome to comments of gareth southgate's england side it is an england side that in previous years has got fans hopes up it's an england side that in previous years has gone close but fallen at the penultimate and final hurdle under gareth southgate of course you remember four years ago in russia they got to the semi-final. They were knocked out by the runners-up Croatia in that tournament. And then a few years later, last year to be, in, to be exact, uh, with the European Championships, England got to the final and lost on penalties to the Italians. And the Italians, unfortunately, won't be at this tournament this year, but England most certainly will. During those times, obviously Southgate's had to face a lot of criticism and he's had to face a lot of kind of England's former demons, penalty shootouts, in-house kind of fans divided, whatever you want to call it. And he's managed to kind of get people or the majority of people on side. Me personally, I do not, I do not care for the England national team that much. I watch them in major tournaments. I do not care for them in stuff like the Nations League. It doesn't bother me just for me it's a more of an inconvenience to club and domestic football because I prefer that over international football but these major tournaments are obviously special and they're special because they only come around once every four years and I'm not gonna be completely involved if England are successful I'm not gonna completely lose my mind over it but at the same time I'm not gonna completely lose my mind over it if England once again fail like they normally tend to do in previous years of course before Southgate you had an England team that on paper should have gone on to do good things in these kinds of tournaments that never really did Southgate is like the first manager in recent memory to obviously go that far within tournaments and to get people believing that maybe England are on the building blocks and the platforms necessary to get uh, to, to help bring football home it could happen in Qatar obviously stranger things have happened and maybe um, if obviously Southgate changes his ways a little bit and changes um, his, his approach to certain things maybe it could happen I still think that the biggest hindrance to England is him because of the way that he sets his teams up the way that he chooses reputation over form and that's kind of evident in the kind of team selection that he's that he's put forward for this tournament and then we'll go through that in, uh, in a little bit more detail in a little bit but just with the way that he sets his teams up in certain times with the way that he approaches games his style of play i just don't think it's ideally the best for this kind of tournament I don't think it's the most e easy on the eye the most uh, I the most appealing kind of football to play and I don't think it's gonna win him any silverware or 
should I say, the main golden trophy at the end of this tournament. Like, like I mentioned earlier about reputation over form, you only had to look at some of his team selection for that. Um, I picked out three in total. I get the whole Ivan Tony thing. I personally would have picked Ivan Tony over Callum Wilson, but if it's true about obviously the investigation and everything, I, I understand why he's not quite picked Tony for this tournament. I can make my peace with that one. What I can't make my peace with though is choosing Harry Maguire over Fikaru Tomori. Tomori has been excellent since obviously joining uh, AC Milan in Serie A. For the past couple of years, he's been excellent. He's a Serie A winner. He's been uh, great for the Italian giants. But for some reason, he doesn't get a pick. He, he doesn't get picked, and Harry Maguire does. And Harry Maguire's been sat on the bench all season, and has obviously been very controversial for Manchester United for the past couple of years. But just because that he's been a part of the England team that's had about five defenders around him, including two centre defensive midfielders. And obviously he scored a couple of headers because let's face it, when you're a six foot five giant or whatever and you don't score from set pieces, then there's gonna be something wrong with you. He gets in ahead of Tamori. Just seems a bit strange to me. Another one is Calvin Phillips. Now he had a very injury hit past couple of years at both Leeds and it's carried on seemingly at Manchester City barely played any football this season but yet because again of his England reputation he is in over someone like say just off the top of my head James Ward Prowse for example who's been playing week in week out and could actually provide us a decent threat from set pieces those are the two that I'm a bit baffled about there may be one or two others in there that may be a bit controversial as well but those are the two that I personally picked out and again it shows that Southgate chooses reputation over form and that's kind of bad because if you look at the current form of the England squad it's not very good so you know you can go back to the World Cup four years ago in Russia and see that England did pretty well you can see that they got to the final of the European Championships last year but since then in the UEFA Nations League and again Nations League is to me it's like who cares but they're trying to push it as a, as a real tournament and everything they got relegated from their group a group that consisted of Hungary, Germany, um, I want to say Spain as well, I think. Um, they got relegated from their group. It's like, it's not great. These are the kind of teams that they're going to have to go through in this tournament. And if they can't beat them kinds of teams in this tournament, they not going to be in that tournament. And what I hope they got beating them at a World Cup. It's not, it's not looking good. It's not really... It, it's not looking good. Like I said, the current form they're in isn't great. But Southgate can turn it around. And Southgate can change my opinion. He just has to release the shackles of this team. This team can be extremely dangerous. They've got plenty of attacking talent and attacking flair on that pitch. But how much freedom is Southgate going to be willing to give these players? You look at the teams right from front to back. You've got Harry Kane, obviously. You've got Raheem Sterling. Marcus Rashford can come in. Bukayo Saka on the right-hand side. You've got James Madison, Mason Mount, um, Jack Grealish even <laughs> uh, in the midfield. You've even got Trent Alexander-Arnold at right back. Like, how much freedom and attacking talent and how much attacking talent is going to be there and how much freedom are they going to have to express and give the freedom to show that attacking talent on a regular basis look for me england can go far in this tournament of course they can but it's all about what, what southgate is going to do in game and uh, approaching a game that's gonna that's gonna for me see how far this England side can go they've got the talent to do it they've got the attacking talent to do it but is Southgate going to give them that in a group that consists of England Iran USA uh, and Wales in my opinion England should easily get out the group obviously stranger things have happened but England should get out the group but to get to knockout ages in the round of 16, I think it's probably going to be their ceiling for them. Next up, we're going to come to Portugal. 
And could this be the last tournament for Mr. CR7? Of course, Fernando Santos led Portugal to that incredible European Championship triumph back in 2016. But since then, it hasn't always been as successful for Portugal as that. And this obviously could be the last chance to give their best ever player, Mr. Cristiano Ronaldo, the perfect send-off. Look, for Portugal, for me, they have a truly incredible team. Individually... They are an incredible team. You look at the pieces they have in different areas. They have a great team full of talented and quality players. Especially in that midfield and the attacking areas. I think they've got a pretty frightening attack and midfield. But it's about whether they can be a cohesive unit. It's about whether they can play together. It's whether they can play for each other. It's whether or not... They can combine well to obviously be the kind of strong unit that they were back in 2016. It wasn't the most wasn't the most exciting of tournaments back in the European Championships of 2016, but Portugal managed to take that to their advantage and made it obviously so that they could go on and be successful and triumph in that particular competition. You look at obviously the the um, the team, the squad that they have at their disposal, full of talented players that we all know about uh, for the most part. A lot of Premier League talent in there as well. One key player that does miss out though is going to be Liverpool's Diego Jota, who unfortunately misses out through injury. Seems to score a lot on international duty when he's with the Portuguese national side, so I think that he will be a big miss for the port for the Portuguese side. But there's still plenty of talent in there. You've got the likes of Ruben Diaz in defence, obviously. You've got Ruben Neves, Bruno Fernandes, João Felix, Ralph, uh, Rafael Leo, uh, all in attacking areas. And of course, Ronaldo himself, who obviously will be the key man. He um, obviously will be the poster boy shall we say, for, for Portugal, but there are a lot of eyes on him, given obviously his most recent uh, controversial and no holds barred interview that he gave Piers Morgan recently in terms of his current situation with his club. And that could be a big factor for Portugal, whether they like it or not, on or off the pitch. It could obviously... Uh, run through the entirety of the squad. We have seen in the past that when a, when one or two of the players are at each other's throats or one or two of the players are unhappy or whatever it may be, it can affect a whole squad and it can affect an entire na uh, country and nation and squad's chances in these kinds of tournaments. I think we've seen it with the likes of Italy and France in previous World Cups. Um, so it will be interesting to see if obviously that recent interview uh, or Ronaldo's unhappiness, Ronaldo getting on a bit and not, sh uh, and obviously being on a slight decline, shall we say, um, will affect this side. But for me, I am going to look away from those kinds of players and obviously Ronaldo himself because I think personally the key player of Portugal's World Cup will be one. Bernardo Silva. I don't particularly like him as a as a player, as a uh, as an individual, as a person. But as a player, I have to admire him because he is he is pretty good. He's very very good. I've seen him plenty of times at Manchester City. I think he can be a bit disrespectful at times and a bit weird in what he says and everything. But as a player, he is a great player. We got to we got to admit that. For me. His energy, his work rate, uh, obviously, what, his technical ability, what he can do on the ball will is, is always a great asset, and I think that it will be no different for Portugal this time around. I think that he keeps them ticking over. I think that he sets the tempo, and I think, like I said, he will be a big player for Portugal going forward in this tournament. Like I say, it... The whole Ronaldo thing right now could be bad or could be good for the entire team. They could all rally around him. They could all be against him. 
Is this going to be the Ronaldo show for Portugal? And if so, will it have a positive or negative impact? It's a more well-rounded Portugal side than we've seen in previous years. Do I think they'll go on and win the tournament? Of course, with Ronaldo at the helm, you've always got a chance. But is everything that's stressing him out this season at club level going to boil over onto the international level? And for me, as much as I can see Portugal going into like the quarterfinal stages and everything of this tournament, they could also bottle it completely. And they could also fall apart. It'll be interesting to see what happens with Portugal going forward. Next, we come to Germany. If there's one thing that you can take away from this video, it is don't sleep on Germany in this World Cup. They have a massive chance, in my opinion, of winning this competition because they've just got a lot of things going for them. They're going to be looking to obviously redeem themselves from that huge, disastrous uh, 2018 campaign in which obviously they went into it as the current holders of the World Cup but failed to even get out of their group stage in what was a pretty horrendous uh, campaign for them. This is, all, this is also going to be the first World Cup that they have a new manager at the helm. Hansi Flick has since taken over from Jacques Love following obviously the last World Cup and the last European Championships. And he is obviously looking to kind of redeem Germany for a couple of bad tournaments in general. He obviously also has form in these kinds of tournaments, not up to this scale of a World Cup. But of course, he won the Champions League with Bayern Munich. He knows all about the format. He knows all about this kind of competition. He is no stranger to what lies ahead in Qatar for 2022. You also have to look at their squad. It is a stacked squad. It is a beefed up squad. It is a very promising squad. It is a very feisty squad. It is a very, very, very strong squad in general. And it's got a mixture of youth and experience to go along with it. Some players that we obviously know about. Some players that are coming through to this stage and are looking to try and break through as another big prospect. You've, of course, got the, the usual suspect, the likes of Manuel Neuer in goal. We know all about him. The captain, obviously, no stranger in this tournament. Previously won it, obviously, in, uh, in 2014. You've got Joshua Kimmich as well, the very versatile and experienced Joshua Kimmich. You've got Mario Goetze back in the German fold and, obviously, best known for scoring the winning goal many years ago in the final. You've, of course, got Thomas Muller as well, another one who is strong, another one who is well-known, versatile, very much underrated is Thomas Muller. A mixture, a lot of experience there to add to a long list of other names that are also going to be at this tournament for the Germans. Add that to the likes of use uh, to Borussia Dortmund duo. Karim Adiyemi and Yusufa Mukoko. Two prospects that are looking to break through at Dortmund and can possibly break through at this tournament and possibly make a name for themselves here. More exciting prospects coming through for the German national team and of course for Borussia Dortmund themselves. It is exciting. If you're Germany, you should be excited by this because this is a very, very good stacked squad. Slightly changed and got new ideas from obviously Hansi Flick taking over from Jakim Love. And I, for one, am thinking that maybe Germany might be being a bit slept on here. People seem to think it's going to be between the two South American countries with France also lingering in the background. And you know what? They may be right. They definitely may be right in that, but don't rule out Germany. They've, of course, got history in this competition. They've won it uh, on, a, on, 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 I think, four, three or four occasions. Very, very good chance of doing that again in this tournament is what I believe. Will they actually go on and do it? I don't know. I still think there may be one or two question marks over... Their strike force, I know it's strong, I know it's got plenty of pace and flair, particularly in wide areas. I 
I just think maybe sometimes they might lack a, a plan B sort of centre forward. That if things aren't going too well, they may need something a little different. But at the same time, if plan A is going to work, then plan A is going to be all they need to be successful in this tournament. Don't sleep on Germany. Cannot stress that enough. They're going to be strong this year. Next up, we're going to come to the, the defending champions, France. And they are going to have to look at not only defending their crown, not only beating the other teams that are in their group and then knockout stages, of course, but also they're going to have to look at trying to overcome this winner's curse that has been developing for the past few tournaments. What I mean by this is that when you look at 2010, the Italians went into that competition defending the World Cup. They got knocked out in the group stages. In 2014, Spain were the defending champions. They got knocked out in the group stages. And as we previously just discussed, in 2018, Fra uh, Germany went into that competition as the defending champions. And they got knocked out in the group stages. Could this curse carry over into 2022 in Qatar? With France being the defending champions. Could they get knocked out in the group stages? Of course they've got a very good chance of getting through. But if the curse is, does continue. It could be a very interesting read. For those who like narrative and intrigue and mystery and story. Away from that though. Realistically. France should have no problem in getting past their group and getting into the knockout stages and going far in this tournament. Their squad is stacked. Their squad is just oozing with talent and ability. It is scary how deep this France, this French national team pool is because of how incredible their squad is. You've of course got their manager Didier Deschamps who obviously guided France to that World Cup triumph a few years ago. He's since gone on to win the Nations League with them. Somewhat surprisingly lost in the European Championships last year to Switzerland in the knockout stages. Um, but could be seen as a bit of a one-off maybe. I don't know. I don't know about that one. Like I say, when you look at the squad, it is extremely stacked despite two very big and noticeable absences. You've got two in the midfield in, uh, of N'Golo Kante and Paul Pogba, two very well-known figures in that France midfield, two, uh, two that work well together in that France midfield and on a European, uh, on an international football stage, are very good together and rise to the occasion uh, on many of occasions. But obviously they're going to be missing. And so the burden would fall onto the likes of a younger squad. Maybe a, a, a fresher kind of squad. In the likes of like Eduardo Camavinga and Aurelien Chouinemi. They could be obviously brought to the forefront in this tournament. For those two absences. But it's still got plenty of talent in other areas. Plenty. You've got the likes of Usman Dembele. And Kingsley Coman. Providing speed and flair from the wide positions. You, of course, got the poster boy, Kylian Mbappe, leading the line, being up front, got experience of winning this competition now. He's, of course, grown a lot as a footballer since then. He's obviously going to be one of the, one of the ones to watch in this tournament. You've got the experience of Antoine Griezmann and Olivier Giroud. Probably mainly in reserve for those, but still... In reserve, they're not bad backups to have if you're obviously in need of a goal very late on in the game. Goal, the goal scoring ability of Karim Benzema had an incredible year with Real Madrid, winning the Champions League, winning La Liga, Ballon d'Or nominations, individual awards, had an incredible year. What better way to cap it all off than to win the World Cup with France. It would be incredible for him. I still think as a as a team overall, 
There are still some question marks defensively. I don't think they're the best at times defensively, and I think they can be got at. Um, and not only that, but I also think that their manager doesn't play the best of football. He kind of plays... He doesn't really have a style. He doesn't really have an easy on the eye kind of style and that kind of worked to his advantage obviously in 2018 when they won the tournament and it's all about winning and these types of things it's not necessarily about style it's about substance over style and whatever that and i get and i get that but i think at times the french the, i think the french team would actually like to see a bit more excitement i personally would i'm not french but obviously i personally would like to see a bit more excitement from this french squad because it's got so much talent or so much ability I think it, it does miss a bit of a trick or two when there's no uh, excite when there's not really a massive excitement level uh, to their to their play, and I think that sometimes that can go against the manager a little bit. And I think that they're just going to have to. That I don't think their chances are going to change that. So it's going to be interesting to see whether that whole shtick works again in this tournament or not. But I think they are going to be strong contenders. I think they've got a strong enough squad. I think with Mbappe up front, of course, they've got a chance. But it's going to be very intriguing to watch them going forward. And like I say, they're going to be strong contenders. Whether they actually go on and win it or not, I'm not 100% sure of that. The next team we're going to come on to is Brazil. Big, big, big chance to make it six World Cup triumphs for the most successful country in this competition. Manager Tite has got a lot of experience to work with here and also some uh, plenty of exciting, young, talented and flary kind of players to bring into the fold for this one. There's a lot of expectation though that's going to be riding on the shoulders of those players and the manager himself to bring home the World Cup but they have a very good chance of doing so, in my opinion. They're a more well-rounded team than they have been in previous tournaments. When I was looking at the squads that they're going to be taking to Qatar, it's a more well-rounded, more balanced squad than what I've seen in previous tournaments. They're not relying so much on Neymar going forward. They have plenty of other players that can obviously take that kind of weight and expectation off of his shoulders and put it onto their own as a way of balance. And that is what may happen here. And that is why I think a lot of people are putting them to be one of their favourites to go on and lift the trophy at the end of this tournament. They've got a solid squad right the way throughout. It's very solid. But of course, the big notable absentee on this was Liverpool's Roberto Firmino, who I think was very unlucky not to be getting a call up over some of the other attacking names that were there. But for one reason or another, Tite just didn't like him, didn't fancy him, didn't fa fancy put him into the, into the squad in strength of depth. I know that obviously this is a Brazilian squad that is teeming with strength in depth and strength in other areas as well. But given Firmino's current form that he's in with Liverpool this season, he's, he's not quite back to his full best, but he's getting there. He's obviously got a lot more goals and assists output than a lot of the players that are actually in the attacking lineup for Brazil right now. So I do think he's a little bit harsh um, to miss out. But other than that, like I say, this squad is beefed up. You've got two of the best goalkeepers in world football right now to choose from. It must be a bit of a selection headache. Two of the best in, in the world that can be easily relied upon in Alisson of Liverpool and Edison of Manchester City. You've got experience of Thiago Silva commanding that back line. You've got a beefed up and versatile midfield with plenty of options in there. Plenty of, uh, of options, whether you want to see out a game, whether you want to go more attacking, a bit more flair, a bit more creativity, that kind of thing. You've got plenty of other options as well in the attacking areas. Plenty of speed, plenty of flair, plenty of ability and creativity and quality in those attacking uh, areas. Obviously, you're looking at uh, Neymar, you're looking at Vinicius Jr., um, just to name a couple. There's so much there. You've got Martinelli, you've got Gabriel Jesus. There's so much there for Brazil 
to sink their teeth into and to obviously bring on from the bench um, in certain games that it can always leave opponents thinking and not giving uh, not giving opponents a, mo a moment of rest. Uh, so it's going to be very intriguing to find that out as the tournament goes on. What is going to be their starting eleven and what their game plan is going to be as the game changes. Obviously, Neymar is the poster boy still. We talked about how the weight of expectation has been lifted off his shoulders. He's less relied upon now because the team is a bit more well-rounded and well-balanced. But he's still the big name on that team sheet. He's still the poster boy for it. I do have slight question marks over them defensively. But at the same time, I still think they're going to be the big favourites for me. Big favourites in a lot of people's eyes. And I think they're going to have a strong chance at bringing home World Cup number six back to Brazil. Before I go on to name who I think is going to be my favourite, and you've probably already guessed it by now who it is, I'm going to just go for a couple of the other teams that I look at and I obviously have big names in this tournament, but I just don't think we'll make it very far. Spain, I think Spain have a good squad on paper but I don't think it's beefed up enough in the attacking areas I think in wide areas they've got plenty of flair and speed and, and attacking prowess uh, but I just don't think up front leading the line they have enough and I don't really trust Alvaro Morata to do that I don't really trust uh, any of the other players uh, that they've got that can fit in that role to do exactly that but again they're going to be fun to watch their tiki taka style of football is going to be very intriguing to watch as per usual but i just don't think they will get far in this tournament uh, or, or as far as to say the the semi-finals and finals uh to be concerned and belgium look with kevin de bruyne you've always got a chance his creativity can lock any defense and on their day they can rally up and rally around but I think the days of calling Belgium the dark horses for their quote-unquote golden generation um, are kind of over. I don't really rate their manager massively. I don't think they've got enough now or they've kind of passed it a little bit to be strong contenders. Likes, I, I think I'll put them in the category of Spain. Quarter-finalists maybe at most. But other than that, I don't really see them getting further than that unless they get, a, obviously, a very um, very nice draw for them towards the final. But yes, two of them teams that should be noted, should be talked about, but I don't think will make it anywhere near the semi-final or final stage. And finally, my pick to win the World Cup, Argentina. It was a toss-up between Argentina and Brazil, I will admit. I also considered France. I also considered Germany. I'm still not entirely convinced by France. Germany, like I say, do not sleep on Germany. But Brazil and Argentina were the two that I said right from the beginning were going to be the strong favourites. And you know what? It could be... It really is 50-50. And the only reason, the only reason why I say Argentina is just because I want it to be the fairy tale ending for Lionel Messi. I want it to be the perfect fairy tale ending for, in my opinion, the greatest of all time to ever step foot on a football pitch. I it's obviously going to be his last tournament, and I want it to end the perfect way for him, which is him to finally win the World Cup. Obviously. Argentina coming to this one, they are the most informed team of this tournament. They haven't lost in about three years. They have an unlikely hero at the helm in terms of their manager. Uh, Lino, uh, Lino Scaloni is obviously the Argentinian manager. He's obviously um, done some incredible things since taking over Argentina. Like The Argentina squads of years gone by have always been unbalanced. They've always had... Uh, in-house issues shall we say he's kind of found peace and harmony within this squad right now and hence why Argentina are on the kind of run and form that they're in right now going into this tournament as the most informed team um, in this World Cup and hence why they are massive favourites to go on and win this competition it's looking 
Uh, like, like I say, it's looking like a more well-rounded, a more well-balanced squad. If you look at the, the squad they're taking, there's a lot of talent and the quality within their ranks. They are stronger looking defensively. You look at the likes of Lissandro Martinez of Manchester United. You look at Christian Romero of Tottenham. You look at Nicolas Otamendi, formerly of Manchester City, of course. You, they're, they're well known to a, to a lot of us uh, from around Europe with... Uh, and of course, they have a solid goalkeeper in there of Emi Martinez, who may not be massively world class, but it's still solid enough to be considered a very, very good goalkeeper. They are much stronger and much more balanced in midfield. They have a high work rate midfield with the likes of Rodrigo De Paul and Guido uh, Rodriguez in there as well. It's very, very solid. And obviously, that then. With, with those in place, with that foundation in place of both defence and midfield, you then allow the more attacking players to go and be creative and play their game. Having that kind of solid foundation allows Messi to go and be Lionel Messi. It allows him to go and roam the pitch freely and just fill in the pockets of space needed with his intelligence and with his ability to just pick up the ball and just play and it is obviously working to Argentina's advantage add that to obviously the likes of Latoro Martinez up front with Nico Marti uh, Nicolas Mar uh, Gonzalez not going to say Martinez but it's Gonzalez and it helps it works it's a, it's a big reason as to why Argentina have been so good for so long now and now they can put it on the world stage. I know obviously COVID affected that kind of stuff and everything, but now they can put it onto the world stage and they can look at finally doing something that they have not done in a very, very, very long time. And that is win the World Cup. Their winning streak gives them a good, gives them a good form. It gives them a good platform to build upon for this competition, for this tournament. They are obviously strong favorites in my eyes, and I think in a lot of people's eyes as well, like I said, I do think it is a toss-up between the two South American teams of Argentina and Brazil as to who goes on to win. But for me, they have a very strong chance. I do worry about them defensively. Again, to go on with a similar theme to Brazil, I do worry about them defensively. They are a bit more solid, like I did mention, than in previous tournaments, but I still think that they can be got at and they can be vulnerable on the counter-attack and when in transition. I do think that Argentina uh, do have their moments where they can be a bit sloppy and a bit... Um, just a bit vulnerable. But I still think they have enough about them to go on and cause big teams problems do what is required of them in the quote unquote smaller games and just in general go on to win this competition. Argentina are my pick. Like I say though, don't count out Brazil. Don't count out Germany either. France are also in the mix as well with the squad that they have. But my pick is going to be Argentina and I pray that this is going to be the fairy tale ending for one Lionel Messi. But of course, as I always say, these years, the thoughts, comments, opinions, predictions, feelings, whatever you want to call it, of this guy. I want to know what you guys think. What do you make of the World Cup that is set to begin in a couple of days' time in Qatar for 2022? What are your own thoughts, comments, opinions, predictions, feelings on everything World Cup? Because the World Cup content has officially started. The World Cup is officially, almost, well, almost officially here. And I cannot wait for it to kick off from a pure footballing fan point of view, from a for pure football point of view and opinion. But I'd love to know what you guys think of the, your, your pre-tournament predictions and who's going to have a good tournament, who's going to have a bad tournament, who's going to be the golden boot winner. Everything along those lines will be greatly, uh, will make a great reading down below in the comment section. Cannot wait to read all of them, thoughts, comments, opinions, predictions feelings, whatever you want to call it, down below. Otherwise, hit the like button on there. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you're new and want to see more content like this. Both things always going to be greatly appreciated. And as always, thank you all so much for watching and listening. I've been Fletch. This has been another Fletch Talks video as the World Cup 2022 in Qatar is only a couple of days away from kicking off. I cannot wait for it. I'm sure you guys can't either. And I will see you all again soon. 
in an Olympic. 